for those of you jo joining us, welcome, welcome. We'll be starting in just a minute. But talking about wins, I do want to mention that in if you're in the process of interviewing for a job, looking for a job, this is this is an endurance race. And it's so, so important throughout that race to surround yourself with as much support and also remind yourself daily about your successes, the little wins that you're having every single day, even though they may be small, really celebrate them because you will need that energy. You will need that confidence. You will need to remind yourself how awesome you are so that you keep going with this and present your best amazing self forward in those interviews. Yay, we have Virginia. So all over the world from Australia all the way to East Coast, I guess. Nobody in Europe would be too late um, for Europe. Jenny, do you wanna do you wanna get us started? Yeah, let's get started. Um, welcome everybody. Um, I'm here with Lisa and I'll just give a quick intro to myself and then maybe Lisa, you can do a little intro to yourself and then we'll get started. Um, I have, was a product manager myself for over 15 years. I've worked at big companies like eBay and Yahoo. I've also worked at a bunch of startups and even tried my own for a hot second. And I'm now a executive coach and recruiter and love working with Lisa. Thank you, Jenny. My name is Lisa Kustova, uh, and I am the founder and the chief coach, uh, chief program manager at Career Climb. You see that behind me. And um, the mountain that's depicted behind the logo is Denali. So I'm a mountaineer as well. And Denali was my biggest achievement so far. Um, and my vision, my vision is to help as many mid-career women in tech reach the summits of their careers. And we have multiple summits. We climb multiple mountains as we go through our careers. Prior to career climb, I was, uh, you know, a tech, a tech professional like so many of you here. Um, and I ended up uh, quickly accelerating to a VP of product, uh, spent a number of years as a kind of head of product in several capacities as a senior director, as a, as a VP. But ultimately what I learned was that um, tech is exciting. It can also be quite a harsh place or a lonely place. And so we do need to support each other. We need to encourage each other. Um, especially through times like these that you're going through them, you may be going through looking for a job, interviewing, presenting your best face forward. And that's so important. It's so important for you to have that, that energy. So the support, the community that Women in Product provides, um, that Career Climb provides as well, that Jenny provides is so, so important. So looking forward to the session today. Thanks, Lisa. Um, all right, so just a few logistical things here. Um, just make sure that you're in the session chat. So there's two tabs, the event tab and the session tab. Make sure you're in the session chat. Um, and then if you haven't already filled out your profile, um, go ahead and click on that so that everyone can find each other's LinkedIn and connect with each other and find out more about you. And with that, I think that's it. Logistically, the session will be recorded and the deck will be shared afterwards. So don't worry about taking screenshots or anything. Um, all the links will be clickable in the deck as it's shared. So we'll give that to you after and we'll get started. So Lisa, do you want to kick it off? Yeah. Um, so welcome. And before we get started, let's kind of take a look at the macro view of the so-called job search or the interview process, right? Um, this afternoon, we're going to dive deep into one of those stages, but there's really at least three that you are going to go through in succession. So the first and the most important part to figure out before you even start applying for jobs or getting on the interviews is your message or your marketing message. Uh, Jenny and I did a whole deep dive workshop, two hour one in December, uh, and we'll share a recording to that in your resource section here so you can go and really explore that topic in depth. It's very, very important. Without that, any subsequent step is going to be much more challenging and much more frustrating. So I call, I call it your one fill 
And FIL is a good acronym for one function, one industry, one level. And yes, you may say, but I can have multiple levels or I can do multiple industries, multiple functions. Doesn't matter. Just like, you know, a piece of marketing, you need to have a very specific, clear message at a time so that you get connected to the right opportunities that are you're looking for exactly what you have to offer. If that doesn't work, then you can try another fill later. So just talking about being clear on what you have to offer, where you're positioning yourself, that is the very important first step. The second step is, of course, interviewing, the process of having conversations with human beings, the part where you not only get to be presentable and sharp and articulate, but where you also get to learn about the company and the opportunity and to see whether that's a good fit. It's much like dating. You know, you have to make sure both sides are, um, you know, both sides are aligned they like you, but you don't like them, that's not going to be a good decision to join them out of desperation. Right? So interview, the interview process has, it goes both ways. Um, and that's what we'll focus on for the rest of the session today. Step number three is negotiating, actually uh, looking at the terms and conditions and the expectations and what you're going to get paid and when you start and all kinds of, of benefits that you can negotiate. And uh, I know that there's been a request for women in product to have another blender on that topic. So hopefully look forward to that soon. Awesome. All right. So we're going to go through step two now in a little bit more detail. Uh, the first thing I just wanted to state is if you're doing this over Zoom or some kind of video chat platform, make sure that you've got your setup clean. Um, what I've seen a lot in interviewing people is either the camera placement is off, um, you might have a second monitor that you're staring at in the wrong direction, um, your lighting might not be proper, it might be too dark, or there might be shadows. There could be, um, I saw uh, someone had a roll of toilet paper in the background one time. <laughs> It was really distracting. Someone had a fax machine. I was like, those still exist. Um, so, you know, just try to clean up the background as much as you can so it's not distracting from you. Um, have some notes handy. So if you are on video, this is your opportunity to keep a little note section open in your um, in your screen so that you can refer to metrics as needed. Um, you can, it's like quick cliff notes, easy to refer to. Uh, make sure your audio is clear. You can test that with a friend. Um, try to limit your hand gestures so you can see, um, keep your hands down if possible, try not to reach towards the camera and make sure you close the door, close all your windows, shut your phone off and um, limit your distractions. Anything you wanted to add there, Lisa? Make sure to have good access to your mute and unmute button or you will have this awkward pause. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you know, uh, honestly, don't overcomplicate it. Don't overthink it. Uh, because, you know, for somebody like me who does a lot of events online and does podcasting, like on my professional mic, you don't need that. Just what Jenny said, make sure you're well lit. If you're wearing glasses like me, make sure that the reflection, like, for example, if you see right now, I'm going to put it so it kind of glares. If that is happening, make sure that your lights are, are positioned in such a way as not to create glare, because when a person can see your eyes, they're more likely to trust you. This is, this is kind of an important thing. Don't be backlit. So no sh shadows on your face, um, because again, that's kind of, that's a psychological thing. We trust somebody if we can see their face clearly, their eyes. Yeah. So you want to be well lit. Audio, um, make sure that you're not like if you're happen, make sure you are in an indoor environment without a lot of background noise. If you have to take an interview outdoors, be careful with those headphones with picking up wind. So that's really grating on the ears. 
Um, and so that can that can also create create a bad impression. So just be mindful of your environment. Don't overthink it. Um, and yeah, you'll be you'll be okay. And another trick, if you really want to get if you really want to get fancy, is I have um, a camera. So right now I'm looking straight at the camera because I have it positioned over uh, the, the screen that I'm looking at. It's called Center Cam. You can find it, it was a Kickstarter uh, project. It's not on Kickstarter any longer, but it allows you to kind of position a tiny camera over the face of the person you're talking to and it looks like you're talking straight at them. Last thing I just thought of is um, some people really like to use fidget toys. Uh, just make sure it doesn't make any sound when you're doing it. I've heard people play with like putty or poker chips and it makes a lot of funny sounds while they're talking. It's distracting. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, let's move on to micro expressions and posture. So um, especially over Zoom, there's only a small amount of you that I can see. And the little micro expressions that we make can be the only way that we can read um, how you're feeling or what you're trying to express. And oftentimes we don't really notice our own micro expressions. Um, I put a link in here so that you can kind of take this fun little test to see um, how you can read micro expressions. But uh, what I always recommend is recording yourself so that you can go back and see the things that you tend to do a lot. So some people might raise an eyebrow a lot. Some people might, um, you know, smile sideways a lot or um, or talk really quickly or make this like frowny face sometimes. Um, just record yourself and see if there's anything that you didn't know you were doing. Yeah, and I would also say there's a question in the chat about uh, dress code. Um, if people are dressing informally for Zoom interviews, that's a surprise for me because I do think that at least the part of you that's visible should be reflective of your attitude towards that job. So at least, you know, for women, I think we have lots of options. Even if you put on a pair of earrings, if you put on a little bit of lipstick, you don't have to put on makeup, but if you put on a nice accessory or scarf or wear a nice top, I think that just shows respect for the person you're talking to because it is a job opportunity. You don't want to be too casual like you just rolled out of bed. Your thoughts on that, Jenny? I mean, for me, I've seen a couple things that I remember is I interviewed somebody who just got out of a hot yoga class and she was wearing a tank top and she was still sweating. Um, I think that was too informal. <laughs> um, T-shirt is fine with me usually, um, especially if it's a startup, if it's um, an, you know, a, a more tech focused role. I mean, those tend to be a little more casual. Um, there was a guy who had a, a baseball cap on backwards and he was wearing a breast cancer t-shirt, but it had boobs on it. Um, <laughs> that was inappropriate for me. Um, but for the most part, I would say that um, it's as long as you're looking buttoned up and professional, that that's good enough for me. I don't think you need a suit or anything. All right. Let's move on to, okay, so I have a bunch of stuff in here. Bear with me. There's a lot of content. Um, this is going to address the IC screening interview. Um, we will talk about leadership later, but this is for individual contributors. So first thing is prep, and then I'll then talk about the interview itself. So prep before you talk to a screener, know your audience. So who are you about to talk to? What is the company about? What is their mission? Um, you can read here values, reviews, news. You can go on Blind. You can go on Fishbowl. You can go on Glassdoor. You can go um, on so many different places. You can go on LinkedIn and connect with people in the company and chat with them about their current experience with the company. But do your research. Um, you definitely don't want to come in cold and not know anything about um, the background of the company. Maybe there's some news article that it's, uh, you know, something's going on in the company right now. Maybe they just got a round of funding. Um, it's great to know these things top of mind and also who you're going to be talking to. So you should know the name of the person. You should be able to look them up on LinkedIn. Um, if, if you have a recruiter that you've already spoken to, you can always ask for who it is you're going to be speaking to. In this case, we're really talking about the recruiter. Sometimes a hiring manager might do the screening interview but usually it's going to be the recruiter. 
Um, so the second thing I said is have answers to regularly ask questions on the tip of your tongue. So practice, practice, practice. Um, a lot of people haven't interviewed in a long time and haven't had to answer some of these questions. Um, and so it's not a muscle that you've used recently. So just practice with your with your recordings, practice with your friends. There are many Slack channels. There are tons of, there's a Women in Product Facebook group. Um, lots of people want to practice with you. Um, so make sure you do that. Um, I'll go through one example of a question now, which is your elevator pitch, which I think everybody should practice, which is tell me a little bit about yourself. And this is your intro. You're going to have to use it all the time, whether it's in person in a hallway or at a social event or in any of your interviews. This is usually how we kick it off. It's just a casual tell me about yourself. And I have seen this go from 10 seconds to 25 minutes, people tell me about themselves. So try to keep it between 30 and 60 seconds, no more than three minutes, and you want to be concise about it. Um, so again, practice recording yourself. Um, it should give you a good story of you and your experience and also where you want to end up and what you want to do. Um, this is a great time to practice your storytelling. As a product manager, you have to be a great storyteller. So this is a prime example. It's a microcosm of how you're going to be telling stories at work. Um, and keep it fun and entertaining to listen to. You should um, you know, vary your tone, pause as needed. Don't zip through it really quick. Um, Lisa, do you want to add anything specifically about the elevator pitch before I move on? Yeah, the elevator pitch is the reason why you need one fill. Remember the acronym from what we talked about earlier, one function, one industry, one level. That's all you have time for. And when you are talking about it, talk about it as a present tense. So at times I hear somebody said, oh, I was a director, you know, for a platform product. No, you know what? You're a director. You're like a driver in a Formula One team. You're changing teams, but you're still a Formula One driver. So talk about it in present tense, who you are, what you are. That's why the fill is very important. Um, you know, what is the level that you operate at? Uh, what is the um, industry that you specialize in? What is the function, product management or something else? And uh, talk about the impact that you like to drive, uh, you know, the type of, of problems that you like to work with in a concise way that is like punchy and, uh, and, you know, just conveys the point in, in, in fewer words. Awesome. Um, so kind of to your point, Lisa, to be able to clearly articulate what you're looking for next. So this is another question you'll get a lot is, okay, I see you've done this, or I, as, some, as um, someone just asked, I see you've taken a break for a certain amount of time. What do you want to do next? And back to the fill again is if you're like, oh, well, I can do anything. I've heard this so many times. I am a generic product manager and I can do back end, I can do front end, I can do, I can do mobile, I can do web, I can do anything. Um, okay, that's great, but I'm interviewing for a very particular role right now and I wanna hear that that's what you wanna do. So tell me exactly what you're looking for next and be able to say why and make it convincing. Um, think about the manager. Think about the team, the product, the company, the mission, the comp, the benefits, anything that is drawing you to this particular role. Is it the technology? Is it the space that they're in? Is it the industry? Um, tell me a little bit more about why, uh, why you are wanting this job. Um, storytelling is important, as we talked about, and that's a whole nother topic kind of but um and then have questions make sure you have questions of your own you'll get an opportunity to ask questions at the end of every interview hopefully um and this is your chance the worst thing you can do is say nope i'm good i don't have any questions um so it could be questions about the team it could be questions about the company given your research that you did earlier um it could be questions about you know what kind of funding does this product have how many cross-functional team members are going to be supporting my team how big is my engineering team um do i have an a b testing team am i going to run those myself is there a user research team how long have the people on my team been in place have is it a new team um, so so many questions you can ask but what is important to you and that's what you're going to go with lisa do you want to add anything there yeah and also remember this is a conversation it's a give and take this is not like you 
you know, pressing the speak button and off out comes the scripted question. Uh, make sure that if they've mentioned something earlier on in your conversation and you have questions around that, ask, you know, ask, hey, you mentioned X, Y, Z. Can I ask you how you see it, you know, looking in the future or what, what are your growth plans for this part of the team? Or you mentioned you want to enter this market. Do you see that becoming a roadmap priority on OKR in the next year? So they want to see that you're able to be contextual and not just kind of read off like pre-scripted questions that, you know, and, and at times you have to be careful. If you're just waiting for your turn to speak, you may ask a question that the person has kind of answered before, and it just shows that you weren't listening. So that's why don't really stress about having your questions prepped. Just trust that if you're paying attention, if you're present, that you'll naturally start having these questions come up in your mind that you can ask. Yeah, totally agree with that. Um, and practice. Uh, okay, let's move on because I know we have a lot more to tell you about. Um, and so talking about the interview itself. So when you're in the interview, I like to use box breathing. So I'm also a certified yoga instructor. I think Lisa, you are too, right? Um, <laughs> So box breathing, the, um, the military uses this and it's breathing in for a count of any number you can use four to start with. So breathe in for four, hold that breath for four, breathe out for four and hold it for four. So that's just one breathing technique you can use. Um, calm yourself down before you step into the interview um, and then find a framework. So I, you can just use beginning, middle, end if you want to. There's many different frameworks you can use. The circle framework is a great one. There's plenty of other ones. Um, but this is a great way for you to structure your answers. And sometimes I feel like people ramble on a little too long. Like, the, oh, I forgot to tell you about this. Let me go back. Um, oh, well, uh, are you looking for this? Are you looking for that? And they kind of go a little bit all over the place. Mm -hmm. So a framework will help you bring your answers together. Yeah, um, and I would say that uh, a useful idea to think about is like an onion. Have three layers or practice practice some of the stories or the answers to some of the more common questions in three layers. The first one is just a one sentence, very straightforward answer without any context or background or backstory. The second one is if they ask you, hey, like, tell me more, or can you explain, or can you go into it? Then you can give the second one, which is perhaps like, you know, short paragraph under a minute. And then if they really want to drill down, then you can kind of zoom into specific parts of that product launch story, whatever, wherever you're talking about. What Jenny talks about is so, so, so important. If you don't have, if you're not able to regulate yourself and breathing will help. Uh, when we climb mountains, uh, we use a lot of breathing techniques because at high elevation, there's low oxygen. And I have seen, you know, on my summit climb, on my summit climb to Denali, there was somebody on my rope team that was having, um, um, she was having a um, brain, what is it called? Like, uh, basically her supply to her brain was constrained. So she had to descend very quickly. But very, very quickly, she started losing her ability to say things, simple things or think about simple things. She couldn't remember her address or where she lived. It's really amazing how our brains can shut down with lack of oxygen. And when you're stressed out, there's not going to be enough oxygen to your brain. And so your thinking can go into panic mode. And then you just want to blurt out everything you know to impress the person and to tell them every single detail, don't do that because you're taking valuable time and the person's getting annoyed and they're not likely to, this is, the, this is the fastest way not to get invited back to another interview, one of the fastest ways. So make sure that you have good breathing, you're calm, and then you have those three levels of, okay, I'm gonna give the executive summary and then I'm going to ask, do you, or, or I'm going to pause. And if the interviewer wants to know more, they can ask. And this way, it's a conversation. It's not like how many times I've been as a hiring 
manager just looking at my watch and saying, when will this person stop talking? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I, that's right. And they're on and on and on. Yep. Yes. Yes. Uh, that's my next bullet point. Actually, it should be a tennis match. So exactly what you were just talking about. Stop at logical points. So if you're describing, um, and we'll get into an example next, but if you're describing a story, it should have a beginning, middle and end. Can you stop after the beginning and say, is, am I going in the right direction? Is this what you're looking for? The interviewer, whether it's the recruiter or the hiring manager, they want you to be successful. We want you to move to the next round. We don't want to look for more people. Um, and so, you know, give them what they need. They will guide you in the right direction if you're not going the right way. And as long as you make pauses, um, it, it'll be a lot easier to guide you. Um, the next thing I referred to this earlier is just keep a list of metrics handy. So I know sometimes it's been a long time since you've looked at metrics. Um, you might be referring to a role that you did five years ago. You might be, you might have taken a break. Um, you might just not be in the mindset right now, but find those metrics, whether it is um, asking former coworkers to grab those for you if you don't have them or digging through old documents um, or going through, you know, however you need to find it, get those metrics handy and remember, uh, remember them. Um, one big thing that I see is that people don't give me any idea of context, scale or scope of what they've done. So they'll say, oh, well, I increased um, conversion by 70%. Okay, well, what are we talking about like 10 users? Are we talking about 10 million users? Um, are you talking about was this team of like one engineer or 100 engineers? Um, and so if I have no idea, giving me percentages is not helpful. Um, and so make sure you give that context. Um, anything you wanted to add there? I know, Lisa, you were nodding. No, I think okay. I think this is this is straightforward. Remember, uh, remember, this is kind of a way for them to um, sample the way that you would normally interact with them about anything that may be going on. How do you present or how do you communicate results? What do yeah. you look at? Do you stop and listen for them? If they have any questions, do you give them time to absorb? Do you have different ways of presenting it so that you understand the kind of different implications of the different dimensions of the data. So just, just practice. I think this will kind of flesh out in practice, but good interview practices, um, like having lots of interviews will actually also make you a better, whatever your function is, whether it's product or a related function, it would actually make you a better professional. Uh, someone asked if the, if company numbers are confidential, um, Usually there is some, even, even if you have to step up to a few levels, you can give some idea of, okay, well, how big is the company's user base on their product? It doesn't have to be exactly on your feature. It doesn't have to be um, how many dollars did you make on, on that particular feature that you launched. Um, but if you can tell me the company is at, you know, 3 million users per week, that's completely different than three users per week. Right. Um, so just some idea of scope. Um, OK, and be confident. So one, another thing I see, especially for women, unfortunately, still is that um, women want to like make sure they're getting feedback and they're not like, is this OK? Is, is this right? Um, are you sure? Like, can I answer a different question? Um, and so, you know, it's a little bit hard to say be confident but try, <laughs> I mean, Lisa, maybe you, you have some other advice here, but the confidence in your answer is going to be so helpful because you're going to be working with so many cross-functional partners. You are the voice of your product. You have to convince other teams for budget to get on their roadmap for so many different things. And they want to be able to count on you as somebody who can confidently speak about their own experience. Yeah, I mean, think of it this way. Uh, the hiring manager doesn't want a project on their hands. They don't want, they don't want some, somebody to baby and micromanage and give like micro permissions for every single thing. They want somebody who is mature, 
who understands their responsibilities, who is able to understand proactively where the manager may need support, help, information. Um, and striking that right balance is, I think, one of the benefits of being in the space, being a professional um, and, and, and having, having lots of experience doing that. It, it's, it's part of maturity, but you can also intentionally develop that and develop it faster by, it's not, it's not about you. It's about how you can be an effective contributor towards the team, towards what the company wants to accomplish. And you can't be that if you need to be micromanaged. Yep. I, I completely agree. I, I mean, another area this comes up in is if um, if someone doesn't have experience in a certain area that the role is looking for. So you might see something on the job description that says um, A-B testing is mandatory. Have you done this before? And maybe you have done it a little bit, but you not a lot. And so you're not super confident about it. Um, be confident. You've done it. If you've done it, you've done it. And if you haven't done it exactly the way they've done it, you can learn it. And if you're confident in your ability to learn something, that's good enough for me. Um, so it should be good enough for you. Um, okay, so someone asked about feedback. Um, when I say ask for feedback, I don't mean at the end of the interview. What I mean is during the interview. You know, how, so at the end, when you can ask a question, one question that I love when people ask me is, now that you've gotten to know me a little bit and you've heard my story, do you think that I'm a good fit for this role? Or do you have any feedback for me about how I could position myself in, you know, or any, any amount of feedback questions I love at the end. I want to give feedback and there is no opportunity for the interviewer to give feedback directly to the interviewee after the interview is over. So ask for it during the interview. Um, don't take it personally. Um, I've had so many interviews for people that I really, really loved talking to. And I think they would be a great product manager, just not for this role um, for one reason or another. So I wish I could tell them that. I wish I could just say, like, I really like you, just not for this role, but I can't. So if you ask me, I can probably tell you something to that effect. Um, but don't take it personally. Um, just keep at it, keep that great attitude that Lisa was talking about, keep up your enthusiasm. Um, and, you know, we kind of touched on this a little bit earlier. Remember, you are also interviewing them. Is this the right place for you? Is this where you're going to be successful? Um, there's, you know, you spend more time at work than you spend at home for the most part. So this is going to be your new family, basically. Is this really what you want? Um, and Connect with your recruiter and interviewer afterwards. Thank you notes are welcome. I love thank you notes. We really don't get that many of them, honestly. You'd think that we do, but uh, but we don't. Um, and Lisa, anything to add there? No, I think that covers it. Yeah, so I see someone saying that sometimes interviews don't always give feedback. That's true, but you can always ask. Um, some people will want to give feedback, some people won't, um, but at least you asked and gave them the opportunity to. And also remember, like not all feedback will be constructive to you because if you, if the role was not a fit for you for what you're looking for, for your skills, or they were looking for something else, that's not a flaw of yours. It just, it just, you can't be everything to everyone. So yeah. it's not a great thing. It's like at times if it's clear to you that, oh, you know, I kind of, that was a long shot for this thing. No need to ask for feedback because, you know, it's not going to help you. You're not going to go change your specialty overnight. Uh, the times where I would ask for feedback is if you went really far in the interview process and everything was pointing to everybody liking you, you were a good fit from a skills perspective, experience perspective, what you're looking for. And all of a sudden something, they kind of go dark or something happens. Then you're... Hmm, could be something on their end, could be something on my end, maybe a reference came through that wasn't what they expected. That's the useful part to ask feedback for, because it helps you perhaps take corrective action if something on your end went wrong. Yep. Um, in terms of connecting with the recruiter and interviewer, um, if you have their name, you can add them on LinkedIn. 
if they accept, you can message that way for thank you notes. Um, if not, you can always pass a note to your hiring manager through your recruiter. So that's always an option. All right, next is, okay, I put a sample question here for product managers that I think everybody should know an answer to, if not having more than one answer to this question. Um, tell me about a product that you've worked on that you're proud of. You'd be surprised how many different types of answers I've heard. Um, try again to keep it to three to 10 minutes, not 30 minutes. Um, and make sure you use a framework cover. How did you get here? Was it, um, was it a customer pain point? Did you find the customer pain point? Was it a company mandate that was given to you? Was it a product that you took over from someone else? So give me like a set the scene. Um, tell me about how you like went about it next. And then again, with the context and scale and scope, how big was your team? How big was the product? How much revenue? Give me something to tell me how big it was. And then how did you launch? So hopefully this is a successful launch product. Um, and then what did you do next? How did you know it was successful? Um, what were the next steps? What did you do after you launched? Um, and then again, with the pauses, make sure you pause after the beginning, the middle and the end to give them space to ask questions, to dig into a little bit more detail um, and to guide you in the right direction. Anything to add there, Lisa? I mean, I don't want to open the can of worms of product <laughs> sense interviews and case <laughs> studies and all that. That's a whole different um, set of skills. But the key here, as Jenny has said, is just practice, practice, practice. It, imagine you're telling somebody you're onboarding a new boss or you're know, onboarding a new executive of work and you need to bring them up to speed very quickly. Let them know what happened during this thing or, you know, what was the important points that they should be taking away? What should they know? And practices is really the key to help you fine tune, fine tune your story here. Awesome. Uh, okay. And um, now we're going to talk a little bit about leadership interviewing. So if you are planning on managing a team or if you're interviewing for a leadership role, um, Lisa, do you want to start? Yeah, so, you know, when we're talking about a leadership role, Jenny, in my mind, I don't know if that's your definition too, it's anybody who is managing a team or has some sort of non-IC responsibility. Is that the way that yeah. you're defining yeah. it as well? Okay, great. And so, you know, when does a kitten become a cat? It happens over time. Uh, the same thing with you when you become a leader and a manager, there's going to be an evolutionary process and, you know, you just have to, uh, work with that and talk um, and, and and always the people that that advance quickly in their careers they're always ahead of their level in terms of the types of questions they ask the types of problems that they talk about the types of things that you're curious about so don't get held back and wait for permission for somebody to call you a leader or a manager like always look forward okay um like understand that next level. What is the type of thing required there and start practicing it even before you look for a job. Um, here on the, um, at this level, there's a whole lot of expectations that I think get added on um, to the IC interviews. And this here is especially important for you to understand the market and the competitive landscape to understand how that product fits in to the bigger the bigger world uh, you can demonstrate that by asking questions by offering observations uh, you know that's that's an important piece um, also be able to talk about the strategy um, prepare questions around the strategy. You want to elevate your conversation um, to the level of, of strategy, not tactics and execution. If you feel like you have to prove yourself and you're feeling too insecure and your conversations start drifting into the weeds, into the execution and the minutia, I'm quickly as a hiring manager losing trust that you are able to execute at a manager level. So what you talk about and how you talk about it is going to tell me much more than what you're actually saying. 
um, the toolkit. So here's, here's the image I want you to have. You know, when you are interviewing for a leadership role, the people across the table, and correct me here, Jenny, if that's not being your experience, they really could care less how much money or how much impact you made in the prior company or if you screwed something up and they lost money or something didn't go well. If uh, they don't care about that unless, you demonstrate that you've extracted a process, a skill, a tool that then you can replicate over here. So they don't really care about the achievement because it was for somebody else. But what they do care is like, okay, can this person demonstrate that they understand the principles that underlie the success, that they break it down into a playbook? Are they, what kind of playbook are they bringing over here? So that's how you get to contextualize your stories. It's led us about the accomplishment, but talk about what led to the success and what led to the lesson that you were taking away and how that could potentially be applicable over here. Um, you know, I my early career as a product person was early, early Zynga when we would iterate weekly. And I remember the first time I had a blow up, blow out <laughs> feature that I launched that was in my first couple of weeks on the job. I had to be in front of all the executives, including Pinkas, and I had to recreate my funnel and my assumptions for each step of the funnel on the whiteboard because they wanted to know why it was five times more successful than what I had expected. We, we like got millions of users. We got lots of revenue. So they wanted to make sure to understand and made sure that all the PMs understood what was the secret, what was the recipe for success so we could put in the rule playbook and replicate it. So it doesn't really matter. Your accomplishments are irrelevant unless put in the context of the tool that you've developed, that then you can go over there and benefit them. Um, so have a story or two about each important tool in your toolkit. Um, and then I would say everything else on the slide is kind of, I think, self-explanatory. Do you want to say anything about the toolkit, Jenny? Um, I mean, I think just to reiterate what you already said for leadership interviews, it's more about the strategy and your team than it is about execution. However, there might be one little caveat to that, which is if you're interviewing at a teeny tiny company, um, I do see some startups who want a mix of execution and leadership. And if you don't touch on execution, that could be a fault. Um, if it's a really small company, only because as we all know, at a startup, you have to wear a million hats, you have to do everything. Um, so they they probably want to hear a little bit of both. Um, but your interviewer will likely also guide you in that direction if you don't talk about it yourself. Um, at the larger companies, definitely strategy, but also team. If I don't hear you mention your team and loving leadership and loving growing your team and, and really finding, you know, feeling the passion for that, um, that would be a, a red flag here in a leadership interview too. And I would say, and, and Jenny, this is funny because we were collaborating on the slides late last night. And I was like, there were there were a few bullet points that I think I took out because, and, and I'll explain now why. You had mentioned, did the team love you? Do you have any proof points? The reason I took it out is not that I don't see your point and I don't think it's important for teams to like you. But I think that my observation with women that I've coached and I've worked with and I've gone through my programs are that a lot of them, especially on the more junior levels, confuse liking with effectiveness and with, you know, actually producing results. Mm -hmm. Right. So what is more important? If you're placing the emphasis on somebody liking you, then you could be sacrificing effectiveness. Like no matter how you slice and dice it, if you have to fire somebody, they're not going to like you. But it has to be done at times. It needs to be done. Yeah, right? absolutely. So as a team, you know, I, I took it out because I see a lot of women confusing. Oh, I need my team to like me. I need to be the team's mom. Mm -hmm. No, you don't. Um, you need to have the, your team's respect and you need to 
have a predictable way of leading that team where they understand your ways of thinking, your prioritization, your criteria, so that you're not sending mixed signals and confusing the heck out of everyone. But what you want to convey in this, you know, in this context here is like how, what your philosophy and principles are. And we, I, I know we'll talk about that, but what is your playbook on, on hiring? What is your playbook on motivating and growing talent? What is your playbook in, you know, deciding who to promote and who to not promote? What is your playbook on firing? Right. What is your experience? And you may have only hired one person and maybe not fired anybody. You're still starting to develop that playbook. And it gets to be about that. It gets to be about you as an operator, you as the, you know, grower of teams. And, you know, the better, the better you are at that, the more the team will like you, but it, it's not in reverse. They don't like you and therefore you're a good operator. You're a good operator and then the team likes you. That makes sense. Yep. I just want to be conscious of time and also that not everyone here is a leader. So um, <laughs> let's move on. Um, okay. Uh, okay. So these are tips for leadership interviews during the interview. And so maybe we can cover these like kind of faster um spend as much time asking thoughtful questions and listening and responding okay i think i think this one was yours lisa yeah Mm yeah Yeah, i mean honestly one of the biggest ways you can demonstrate executive presence is how much how present you are and how much you listen and you're able to hold the conversation without panicking your mind about what you're going to say next right so yeah. Make sure that you are able to be present and thoughtful. I like that one. Um, we covered this one more about strategy than execution. Um, macro trends of past companies. Yeah. So again, un- understanding the industry, understanding the company, where they fit in the industry, um, and then be able to explain the business impact of your work. So if you're, if the company's hiring a leader, they're hiring somebody to help grow the business, right? So you have to understand that how your product fits within the business, how all the work that you've done in the past has grown other businesses so that they have examples of you understanding the impact of your work. Uh, maturity, the interviewer should be comfortable putting you in front of the CEO. Okay. I like that one, Lisa, you added that one. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. I mean, look, um, as somebody who's hired lots of PMs on my team, I can say that um, I'm a type of person and I'm probably representative of a lot of hiring managers who just don't have the bandwidth and capacity to um, bridge huge gaps in development of somebody. So I want somebody who's going to be a relatively fast, you know, um, uh, who's going to be fast on uptake who's going to be able to come in and I'll be able to confidently place them in riskier, in riskier situations faster and not worry that they're going to be a fragile, you know, person who's going to fall apart or they're going to be so insecure that they're not going to be able to say a sentence. So really I'm thinking like, can I put this person in front of the CEO and look good? So think about that. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. Um, balance I and we statements. So this goes back to what you're doing versus what the team is doing. If we hear too much, I it's a little too, um, execution focused if it's, and this goes for ICs as well. Um, because of course you have the work that you're doing and then you rely on your cross-functional teammates to do a lot of the work as well. So balancing I versus we, um, is, is super important. I've heard hiring managers say, I didn't hear we the whole time. I'm not hiring this person. Um, they think that they did everything. They're, they're trying to take, uh, you know, take credit for everything. And it's too much I. And then I've also heard the opposite. It was too much we. I don't know what the, this person actually accomplished. I don't know what this person's uh, role was because it sounds like they just relied on their team for everything. So it is a delicate balance and it's going to depend on your interviewer. But I think you definitely need to balance those two. Um, think outside the box, 
zero to one work. So anything that you've built from scratch is going to be super important. Companies want to see, you know, what impact have you made in the past and how can you, again, do that within our company? Um, evidence of having built or grown a team in the past. So have some examples on the tip of your tongue. Having a clear leadership style or philosophy. Um, we'll touch on that in a second. Um, and having a passion for leading teams we talked about. Have you owned a PL? Have you had any board exposure? Have you been in any C level meetings? These are all, um, if you have, you should mention it. Um, if you haven't, that's completely fine as well. Um, make sure your LinkedIn profile shows thought leadership. So, yes, Lisa, this is your go for it. <laughs> well, you know, um, when you watch the webinar uh, recording of the workshop that Jenny and I did, the two hour one back in December, there's a lot more in there for about your LinkedIn profile and what gets to go in there and why it's so important in terms of discoverability on the recruiter side of your profile. But um, to me, thought le leadership is an evolutionary thing. It's not a switch that you flip at some point when you're quote unquote are ready. It's a thing you start developing. It's a muscle, muscle you start exercising. And it has a positive effect because it pushes you to start thinking about macro trends, the market, competitors, you know, what's going on in product management? What are best practices? Uh, what are some, you know, it clarifies your thinking about tools and frameworks and strategies you've already practiced and clarifies your thinking about your own playbook, right? So it's the best interview prep now, if you only have a few weeks to find the next job, it may not be the best use of your time right now in this in this scenario. But as soon as you get to a place where you're, you know, you're in a stable position job wise, do start uh, to write, do start to look for speaking engagements, because that's a very important thought development process that will make you a better thinker, a better interviewer, and a better product person. Um, so it's kind of like, it's not a band-aid exactly, but look to start it as soon as you can. Yeah. Building your personal brand is super important. Love that. Okay. Also good for your resume. <laughs> um, okay. So here's a practice question for leaders is tell me about your leadership style and philosophy. Um, I've seen so many people stumble on this one where they say, well, I'm a servant leader or I, um, I customize my leadership style to each person. And it just sounds so generic. I mean, maybe you are a servant leader, but you need to go into a little bit more detail there. Um, I gave some tips here. Uh, I think we're going to spend more time on the elevator pitch today later. So I'll just leave this one here. If you are a leader, take a look at it later and um, you can reach out to me if you have any questions. Let's go on to red flags. So um, I just put a few things in here that I've seen that are immediate red flags when I see them. Um, excessive complaining about past roles, bosses, and companies. So I know a lot of you have experienced uh, a layoff recently, and you might have a little bit of anger or frustration um, about the way that it was handled or, um, or anything about the company. Try to moderate that a little bit if you can. Um, get it all out of your system with your friends and family, and then come into the interview with a positive attitude. Um, we don't need to hear about like too much negativity about past roles, past bosses, past companies. Instead, try to frame it in a positive way. So instead of I had a boss that was too micromanaging, he was all over my back all the time, frame it as I'm looking for a manager who's going to empower me to make my own decisions and um, take the product in the direction that I see fit. Okay, great. Um, so try to just be a little bit more positive. Um, you, if you do record yourself, you, you can kind of listen for those, listen for those things. Um, not having any questions about the role of the team or the company. So when I say, um, you know, here's, here's the way that the team is structured. Um, do you have any questions? And if there are no questions, that's a bit of a red flag. It's like, okay, well, you just sound like you're going to take anything that I give you. Um, that's a little bit scary. So I want this to be the right fit for both people, um, which means you should have questions about what's right for you. 
Um, if you don't know the basics of the company or the role you're interviewing for, that's also a red flag. I have people telling me, oh my gosh, I'm interviewing for like 20 different roles right now and I can't keep them straight. So I'm not really sure what this one is. <laughs> that's obviously a red flag. Um, not having any clear answers. So um, sometimes people will ramble, as we talked about, um, not use a framework, um, kind of talk around the topic, but not give any specifics. That's going to be a red flag as well. Um, if you're really qualified for the role, but you sound super bored about this particular role, that's a red flag. Um, I've had people go, oh, yeah, I've done that before. Yeah, I'm really good at that. Yeah, I know how to do that but they sound so bored about it. Like they're not excited by it. Um, that's a red flag. And, and it should then, be a red flag for you too. What are you doing interviewing yes. for a position that you're not excited to get? Like there's exactly. millions of, and even in this market, there's th thousands of opportunities for you. All you need is one. You can't take more than one for most of you as full-time employees. So why even consider things that don't excite you? Yep. Steamroller style. So um, when you describe um, launching a product or how you got budget for a product, if you sound like you have a very steamroller style and you're just going to force your way through, I mean, of course, being persistent and being um, a great storyteller and being a good cross-functional team member is important, but the, you know, being overly consensus driven is also kind of a worrisome. Um, can you push stuff through? So it's a, it's a fine line there, but. And I would also say it's dependent on the company culture where you're interviewing. I once uh, knew a designer who's so frustrated because he used, what was it? He used more of the I language in the Facebook interview and more of the we language in the Amazon interview and it backfired in both directions because they actually wanted, Opposite. they wanted more of the other side. Um, so interviewing for a hawk culture company versus a dove culture company um, will, again, I, I don't think you should do yourself the disservice of not being yourself and going to an interview for the type of culture where it doesn't fit. But a person who may be considered a steam roller in a dove culture interview may be a great fit for a hawk culture company. Maybe that's exactly what they're looking for and they'll appreciate them more there. So mm -hmm. this is not, there's nothing wrong with you. Um, it's just be smart and understand the culture of where you're interviewing for and be honest with yourself. Am I a good fit for that culture? Do my values align with the values of that cultural organization? Not what they say on the wall, but all the nonverbal signs and information that you're getting from your interactions with them. 100%. Um, this is a great opportunity to do some networking and to get some insider knowledge of how the team is working. So if you know anyone within the company, if you can meet anyone within the company to find out how they work, um, and then again, this is another place to not take it personally. Maybe it's just not a good fit for your personal style. And that doesn't mean you're a bad person or a bad product manager, just that it might not be the right fit. Um, too tactical. I think that um, product managers have to have the ability to zoom out. And if you are just too in the weeds with, okay, I write product requirements and then I go make sure the engineers do them, um, then it's too tactical. Uh, we want to make sure you're thinking about the company, the business, how it you know relates to the vision and the strategy um, and the budget and all of that as well. Um, and then unpolished communication for someone of your level, especially in a leadership role. I think, you know, we talked about this a lot is you have to be so cross-functional as a product manager. You have to work with so many different people. Um, it's not just a silo where you're working on your own. So super important to polish your communication. Anything else to add there, Lisa? I think we're good. Um, is the next thing hot seating or is the next thing about uh, how, because we had a lot of questions about you know, how they can get a, a copy of the recording. And I'm also, my inbox is blowing up with a lot of LinkedIn requests. So let me just do a quick note. <laughs> There'll be a slide soon where you will find the best way to get in touch with me and Jenny. Both of us, uh, you know, have, have our own practices and businesses. I'd love to get you to subscribe to my email 
newsletter, I'm not going to be able to accept everyone's LinkedIn request. So do go to careerclimb.co and subscribe to my email newsletter. You'll see all the other links and the links to the webinar that we did with Jenny um, that will that will come shortly and will be part of uh, the recording and what is sent out after the presentation. Um, but again, like, you know, if you're finding yourself asking questions like, will this be recorded? Where can I find this? Where can I find that? Please pull out and take advantage of the opportunity to kind of learn and operate at a higher le level. Don't get yourself bogged down into these things. Trust Women in Product. They'll give you all the links, all the information, all the recordings. So instead of going over to LinkedIn and requesting to connect with me or Jenny, come back in here, pay attention, be present, because you're going to miss stuff if you're listening with half of your ear. Yes, I'm talking to all of you who are multitasking right now. <laughs> No, this, this is important because you're practicing presence in an interview setting. You can always go and subscribe to my email newsletter, connect with Jenny on LinkedIn or view the recording afterwards. Why are you doing this while we're here live in person and you can actually elevate your level of knowledge and understanding and practice right now? This is like a unique, unique opportunity. So let's go and do some hot seats then. And, uh, and we'll bring you on stage to give us um, give us your little elevator pitch. Again, 30 to 60 seconds, ideally, up to three minutes. Um, and then we will give you some live feedback. So this is a great opportunity um, for you to hear from both Lisa and myself and get some live feedback. Hello. Hi. Hi, Arvnik. So um, do you have a burning question or would you like to practice your elevator pitch with us? I was hoping to practice my elevator pitch, pitch actually. <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. Um, I'm a little nervous. I don't know why. Um, okay. So. Okay, I'll oh. start. So uh, pretend we're in an interview. Um, hi, Ravnik. Nice to meet you. Um, can you just tell me a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, I'm Ravnik, and I am a software engineer by education. I have five years of experience in various customer facing roles within the cloud based SaaS based industry, uh, particularly the low code application plat platform domain. Um, I have enabled and assisted tens of enterprise level customers in digitizing their data collection processes and supported them through that journey. Currently, I work as a partner growth PM at my company. Um, and my duties include strengthening our partnership with CRM tools like Salesforce and Microsoft Dynamics. Just last year, I, I, along with my team, uh, developed an app uh, to be used on Salesforce that significantly cut down the time that our sales team spent on demoing our product to um, Salesforce prospects and attract new leads. And I'm a detail-oriented person, curious-minded, problem solver, but always uh, keep customers' voice at, at the heart of solving business problems. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. I forgot nice. to set my timer, but I'm sure that was well under three minutes. So good job. Um, if anyone has feedback for Ravnik, please put it in the chat. Um, Lisa, do you want to go first? Uh, no, I actually would like you to go first too, because okay. I have a, yeah. Anyway, go ahead. Okay. Um, first of all, I think you did a great job. Um, it was concise. You gave a good background to where you came from. I could, I remember that you said you were an engineer at first, and then now you're a product manager. Um, you gave the industry, um, the niche that you're in. So it was very specific. I like that. Sometimes people are just like, I'm a generic product manager. I do everything. Um, so that was great. You gave um, some examples of duties that you have and specific technologies that you're using. I liked that as well. Um, you mentioned that you cut down the time by building an app. I kind of missed a little bit of that, but um, there weren't any numbers there. So if you could share numbers, that would be great. Um, and then I like to tell people to add something personal in there just to make it a little bit more fun and make you, like, it makes me feel more connected to you as a person um, when I hear a little bit more about you. So if you, let's say, were on the Women's World Cup rugby team, like, would love to hear about that. Um, uh, and so, yeah, I mean, I think otherwise it was great. Your tone was great. Your pauses were great. Um, 
And then just maybe a little bit more about what you want to do next. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll keep that in mind. And I would say so somebody in the chat is also saying uh, that they kind of missed the um, kind of executive su summary in the beginning because you started a little bit of a, in, in, in chronological order. So all the components were there. I thought it was clear and strong, but it could be strengthened more if you can kind of bring kind of like perhaps like a summary um, blurb in the beginning where you can say I'm software engineer turned PM who is, you know, who works on these types of problems in these type of industries. You know, my experience includes, and then you can continue with the same line of thought that you had before so that you're not getting me lost because I remember, remember also, um, with, um, that's why the, the shorter, the better, because, uh, with like everything from conferences to talks, to videos, to recordings, people tend to remember beginnings and ends and they can tend to get like fuzzy in the middle, especially if the middle is long. So that's why I put, put your punchline up front, <laughs> fill in a little bit of the information that you had there and then end it strongly and then say, here's the role that I'm looking for. Even if it's the same exact role that you said in the punchline, just like capstone it on both ends. I think that'll drive, because I did find myself having to pay attention and follow closely what you were saying. And it required a little bit of effort. And Jenny's really good about that because her job is to listen to a lot of these the whole time. She's more of the recruiter perspective. I bring more of the ADD, like super low attention span hiring manager who just, you know, I want it. I want it very quickly. I want it succinct and I want it like fast. Yeah. And one other thing is um, it, this would be great if you were interviewing for a very technical product management role. Um, if you were looking at like a, a B2C, like mobile app development product manager in an e-commerce space, um, maybe a little less on the technology, a little less on the engineering background, a little like you can say, I have an engineering background, but then that's good. And then talk more about the customer. So the only time I heard you mention the customer was at the very, very end when you said, but I also have the customer in mind at all times. So um, depending on the role, I would focus the, the customer piece, bring it up a little bit. Okay. Yeah, it's it's contextual. You're not going to be like a playback recorder. <laughs> um, you're going to tailor you're going to mention certain things, you know, depending on what the context is. So great, great advice there. Thank awesome. you. Good luck. Thank you so much. I really appreciate <laughs> no all the feedback. No problem. What's next? Like we have Gloria next. If Gloria Tang wants to come on stage. Awesome. And then up next will be Danielle Zimmerman. If you want to go ahead and hop on the stage, we'll let you on when it's um, when it's your turn. Hi, Gloria. Hi. Hi, Hi Lisa. Hi, Jenny. Um, must be my lucky days. I never think that I would be chosen. Uh, <laughs> I do. I actually have a question that is always in my mind um, during the interviews. A lot of times that. Uh, recruiters or hiring managers asking you about the zero to one um, experience, but not many product managers has that opportunities to be on the zero to one. In my case, it's either the product is already there and it's not bringing the impact to the companies. And then I helped improve it and, you know, uh, 10X or 3X the uh, impact for the companies. How would I go about these kind of questions? Because I'm always stuck with the mind of zero to one and I couldn't find other projects. And it's like, a, no, that's not fitting it. And it's, it's like a screen in my mind and I'm scrolling down all the projects. And then I say that this not fit, that not fit. And I don't know. Mm -hmm. how to Lisa, do you want to go or shall I? Well, I have a deeper question for you. Why is it important for you to have a question that answers, I'm sorry, have an answer that answers that question. 
because when it comes to that question, and I don't know how the answer is, immediately I felt intimidated, and then my confident levels like lower. Do you think, do you, do you think that's a question that every single uh, job interview will bring up? Do you think that's a question for every that every hiring manager will care about for every role? Mm, not necessary. But in time when I encounter that, I'll be like, after the interview, I'll, you know, I feel so bad. <laughs> so this is an example. This is an example of what happens when you try to be everything to everyone. Uh, if I have a product that's mature and I look for somebody to run with it and two to three exit, I'm not going to be looking for a zero to one person. I'm going to be looking for someone like you. Hmm. So if you happen to be in a position where you are interviewing and they ask you zero to one and be like, well, it's clearly not a fit right now, right? Mm. You don't oh, like treat these, treat opportunities to discover absence of fit as early, as early information for you to stop wasting your time on an opportunity that may not be a good fit rather than feel bad that you're not able to answer yes to everything that they ask for. Nobody in the world is going to be able to answer yes to every single question that exists out there. We're not everything to everyone. Jenny, do you have a perspective? Yeah, I have two, two thoughts there. One is um, growth. A growth PM role might be great for you. And in those roles, okay. they're probably not looking for zero to one. Um, they're looking to grow an existing product. Um, another thought is that you have done zero to one. Uh, it's just not a whole product. It's probably a feature that you did. You know, you made some changes to the product that led to the three or 10 X growth. That was a zero to one feature. It might not be a zero to one product, but you did do everything from start to finish to build something new in the product. And therefore you went through the whole process from figuring out, you know, is this the right feature? How do we test it? How do we A-B test it? How do we, um, you know, all the whole, the whole life cycle. So I would say you probably have done zero to one work and you're just not thinking of it that way. That makes sense. <laughs> when, <Yeah. laughs> And Gloria, so this is a great trick from, from Jenny. There's always a way to, you know, look at your experience and answer a question like that. But I will still, I will still uh, warn you that if mm -hmm. what they mean by zero to one is a full product zero to one, and that's a mm -hmm. very important part of the job requirement for them, then mm -hmm there's no point is there going to be diminishing returns for you to try to like fit a you know a square peg in the round hole it's not going mm -hmm. to be a good use for your time just because you want to feel it's not a beauty contest you know not everybody's gonna be perfect for every role right and so you have to be okay with that e even though you can kind of fit it in there with what jenny just said be also real with yourself and be like well you know if they're looking for somebody with that, if that's the most important thing for them, then I'm not the person at this stage in my experience, but I can be great value for somebody who's just looking to do, you know, two X or three X, a more mature product. Mm. And we we'll appreciate it there instead yeah. of that feeling like trick them. And now it's all right. <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying trick them, but I do think this is an opportunity to use that be confident approach where yes. it's like, yes, Hey, I haven't built a product zero to one, but I have released and launched successful features zero to one that have led to this amount of growth. If that's what you're looking for, I'm happy to tell you more about that. If you're looking for a full, ah, full product, that's not me. Great, you know, great pos positioning because you can you can say like, what is the context? Give me what your definition of zero to one is because I've done zero mm -hmm. to one in this type of definition. I want to understand what is your requirement. So yes, be confident and also be confident enough to say no in your mind to an opportunity that like you're finding yourself having to do acrobatics. <laughs> to into, right? Yes. Enough to say, this is not worth my time. Yeah. Yes. That's, yes. That's, that's also confidence. Yeah. Thank you so much. And yeah, yeah thanks Jenny yeah. and Alyssa. Yeah. And um, I also learned how to be explicit upfront. 
so, so that even though if they say that they wanted to hear my zero to one in the features, I'm not treat I'm not tricking them. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not giving something that they don't want. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so you, much. Gloria. Thank you. Bye. Hello, Hello. Danielle. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Oh, I love it, love it, love it. Question Tell or us. elevator pitch? Elevator pitch. All right. Because why not? You know what? It feels like hot seat, and Lisa knows like nothing makes me nervous. So like I like now I want to do the pitch. All you know, right. Like, Danielle's like part of our career climb community, and she's uh, a mentor. She's actually taught a class on product sense. So. Um, I highly, highly re recommend you connect with Danielle as well. So awesome. tell it. <laughs> All right. So thanks for the pre-introduction. So I'm Danielle Zimmerman. I am a product leader and I currently run a mobile app team at a large automotive retailer. I started my career as a designer, first working in industrial design on physical products and structural packaging, and then via way of UX got into product and product development through UX design. So I continue to approach product through the lens of design and have really deep empathy for the customer experience. Early in my product journey, I worked on a number of first generation products, being able to do like really deep ethnographic field work and like build something out of nothing, which I truly love. Since then I've worked on hardware, software and embedded. And what I really love is mobile. I love doing native and cross platform work to create a continuous customer experience across devices. And the other thing that I really love about mobile is customers have a higher bar for what the experience is and the level of polish there. And yet you're facing a number of constraints about deploying a binary and not being able to roll things back and make rapid updates. So that's what I'm looking for in my next opportunity is to continue to work on mobile or work on things that are cross-platform in a consumer facing product ideally with a rapid growth environment or an emerging industry. Awesome, thank you. So everyone else, please, if you have any comments or feedback for Danielle, please type it in the chat. Um, Lisa, any, do you wanna go first this time or me again? Um, I, I can go first First this this time. Uh, Danielle, because I have a little bit, I have a lot more background. <laughs> Okay. Not on Danielle. She's been part of our community and programs for a while. So I, uh, I think it's strong, but knowing you and knowing your talents and passions, I would say strengthen the end caps of what you said, specifically the front cap. So I would bring the mobile into the sound bites of the first thing that you say, because you're, you know, that's a growing area. That's the latest that you worked on, what you specialize in. And that may be relevant, especially if that's the role that you're interviewing for, make sure you mention the word mobile upfront and also highly iterative. Like the fact that you are, you know, working in highly iterative cycles is important because when you mention an automotive re retailer, the last thing I'm thinking of is fast iterations. What I'm thinking of is like, maybe they change the product once a year. Right. So be careful about like the words, the words that you position, the sound bites and the front cap will like just highlight the strengths of your experience, which is, you know, mobile, iterative. Um, and that's kind of what what you're looking to do next. Strengthen the end cap, because what the end cap was missing was the word leader. I was waiting for you to say it because you said it in the beginning. And you're looking, but what you said you're looking for is work. I'm like, oh, darn it, Danielle, like you could be like that director or you could be the product lead. Just say it, you know, don't be like, don't sell yourself short on the, on the back end there. That's, that's my feedback. Jenny. Okay. So um, it might help for people to tell us what role they're interviewing for first before they do this. Um, so I have context, but um, I, I'm just going to assume it's a, a mobile, maybe director of product, something like that role. Um, so I think overall, obviously you're confident. I have no comments about your confidence. Um, I did see you were looking at your notes a lot. And so just so you know, I can tell when you're looking down. Um, so practice that. Um, and then I can tell you're a mobile app product manager. That was very clear throughout. Um, but 
and, and with a design background. So I would say you should lean heavier on the technology because you have a design background. So just you saying you came from a design background is enough for me to understand that you have an eye for the user interface. You understand the consumer, you understand how it needs to look. I can't tell how technical you are. I can't tell if you really understand, um, you said native once, but you, and then you said cross-platform, but you didn't mention any technologies. You didn't mention like any of the nuances that you had to learn or figure out or issues that you've run across te technology wise, um, like A-B testing, how does that work on mobile, things like that. What are some other ways to, um, how did you do the cross device stuff? Um, were, were there any specific new ways of doing things that you came up with? Um, what does rapid growth mean to you? Um, you didn't give any numbers that I heard in terms of what does growth mean? What scale or scope are we talking about? You said an auto retailer, but that could be a tiny one. It could be a big one. I don't know. Um, you said you run a team, but I also, again, don't know how big the team is. So it could be one person you're managing. It could be 100 people you're managing. I can't tell. Um, and so some scope and scale and numbers are going to be helpful. Um, I also didn't hear anything if you are looking to be a leader about strategy or the business or a PL or um, how you impacted revenue or direction of the company or direction of the product. Um, I didn't hear anything about, sorry, I'm being really harsh right now, but like. No, I love it. I love okay. it. <laughs> I'm just giving it all to you. Um, the, uh, the success of your app. So you said you launched them, but were they successful? Is this like five-star reviews? Is it like featured in the app store? Is it, you know, usually people will well, you drop some stuff like that. So I'm sure you have something you can drop there. Um, and then something personal. I, again, I love to hear personal stuff, but maybe that's just me. So um, yeah. I would also say that is, yeah, go. Because like, that's interesting to, to hear that about like bringing more of the technical element in like I guess I like I also run an, a platform team, mobile platform team. So even just that sentence saying like I run the platform mm -hmm. team, yes, make architectural decisions for the for yes. all creative development inside the company, and then it's you know tens of billions of dollars of market cap publicly traded. I run a forty five person cross functional. So like yes. this, I think is like the <laughs> this was like the recruiter screen phone call version, right? The like super concise. But so it, all of that stuff is like also on my resume. That's true. So that's true. You've yep. heard it, like you've seen it somewhere at the point when we're having this conversation. Right. Would you still then say like those, like those three numbers or those four points should still go into this quick? I think the technology piece should, there should still be some numbers here um, to prove that you understand at a high level, your impact to the business, especially at a leadership level. Um, so I would say, yes, if you can still get them all in, I think it's a good, also, it's good to have it off the tip of your tongue for when you run into someone in the hallway, or you're getting introduced to someone through a networking call to have your elevator pitch, just like it just plays by default. Um, and it's your story of everything you in a package. Um, but also sometimes they read the resume like a long time before they talk to you mm -hmm. and they don't remember or they're not looking at it or they have I was going to gonna say it's like a, a large bur yeah. burden and you as a great user experienced person will appreciate that it's a great burden to place on the user to rem to have them remember what was in the beginning of the flow, which may have been like five seconds ago or five minutes ago or five days ago. And you also, the most important things, the most important impactful things that are part of your elevator pitch, you want to repeat them more than once, right? So the size of the team, the platform, the fact that, you know, the company is large and I would say how many millions of people or whatever have used your products. That's another way to say the size. The market val valuation is not as important because the, those are going up and down the whole time. Mm -hmm. But the user base is is important. So that could like provide scale. And also I would echo what Jenny said. And this is true for a lot of you listening here. If you have an exp if you have a background of say engineering or design and you're talking about the product role, you don't need to like it's it's great to hear your perspective about 
you know, like you were talking a lot about like the nuances of why, you know, the mobile side is interesting to you because it has better user experience, yada, yada. Save that for outside of the elevator pitch. You can have a whole phil philosophical debate about, you know, the merits of user experience on different platforms. I would say here, you just want the highlights pop, pop, pop. And it's about impact scale. Um, your experience on the technical side, um, obviously design background, but that's encapsulated with, you know, like designer or former des designer. Um, and then I would also bring um, for you specifically, I would mention your passion for uh, breaking down product. Because you're really, really good at that. And again, I'm cheating here because I know about Danielle. <laughs> but uh, you're a geek when it comes down to breaking down every single app that you use. And you just geek out on that. So own it. Be like, I'm a geek for breaking down every single thing. Even when I go on the HOV lane uh, in the Bay Area, I'm thinking about how they can improve the user experience. And that's just kind of part of what I do. And that's like a good personal slash, you know, kind of geek, geeky way to uh, tie it in. A last thing that I forgot to mention is I think maybe a little too heavy on the designer stuff, like the physical packaging and industrial design stuff. If you need to cut stuff out, you that you could cut that out. Um, the I, I liked the, I think, more focus on the, architecture and the platform team. And I think all of that stuff will have more value um, when you talk about the technologies and then the numbers. Yeah. Um, so I'm looking at the clock and I just want to make sure we're respectful of everyone's time, time here. I know that Jenny and I will probably be looking to jump. Um, uh, women in product team, do we have time for one more or shall we kind of go over the resources and, um, and the, uh, the workshop that was recorded in December? Where could they can find that? What's the guidance? Thanks, Danielle. Thank, Thank you, Danielle. Danielle. All right. Uh, let's wrap. Great. Uh, can we bring back that slide with the resources? Oh, yes, that's me. Hold on. Uh, <laughs> share screen. And this is a meta point I want to make for those of you still on the call. Uh, be mindful of the person's time. So if your interview was scheduled for half an hour, uh, you know, make sure that you're keeping track of that. You're stopping and you're asking, um, you know, you know, do, um, just keep your answers as short as possible so that you don't assume that the interviewer can go on over time, can go on for longer. And sometimes that means you really, really want to mention stuff, but there's just no, no time. It's going to be really important for you to pause and say like, hey, we're coming close to time. I want to be respectful of your time. Let me know if there are any burning questions that you still have for me. And I would love, you know, to ask a question if there's, if there's an opportunity as well. Awesome. Do you want to go over the resources then? Yeah. So uh, for those of you who are trying to connect with me on LinkedIn, uh, the best way to connect with me and to connect with the Career Climb community, I want you to go to careerclimb.co, hit the button Get Connected, and sign up for my email newsletter. This way you'll get notified about any workshops and events that I'm doing career climb um, and you'll get plenty of amazing kind of insights and strategies and advice every week. You can also go to Jenny's, um, Jenny's website at jennyku.com um, and mm -hmm. she has lots of amazing resources, including uh, services where she can help you write your profile and resume, practice a case study, amazing, amazing, amazing. Uh, she and I did a two-hour webinar on crafting a winning profile and, and a resume that had plenty of hot seats like this um, that can be really helpful to you. And you can go in that link that's going to be hyperlinked uh, and, and check that out. At the end of that webinar, Jenny and I are giving you an opportunity to uh, get a bundle. That's a bunch of resources from me and two sessions from Jenny to help you write uh, your winning profile and LinkedIn resume. Also, there is a Blender replay link there from the women in product team. And uh, there's also an announcement about 
filling out the survey. So for those of you who are OCD, make sure you go and click on all the links and do all the actions, including, including the um, uh, survey. Again, please make sure that you're taking action, that you're taking advantage of this, these resources. It's one thing to see some, something, another thing to start implementing it. So taking advantage of these resources, practicing, taking an action is very, very important. So for those of you um, who are still here, uh, can you please put in the chat, what is the next action you're going to take after this workshop? Give, me, give us one action that you are going to take as a result of this workshop. So whether it's practice, whether it's, you know, watch the workshop, you know, from December, whether it's like sign up for Lisa's newsletter, which I love. <laughs> <laughs> Ray, somebody signed up for a session with Jenny. Add me on LinkedIn. Updating <laughs> You may practice mocking or record yourself yes. in an elevator pitch, revise your pitch and practice, practice, practice. Love it. Okay. Uh, that's a wrap. All right. Thanks, and everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>